Uh, clearly, on a, on a personal note, uh, I've been a big fan of Storage Field Day, and it's great to have Tejal uh, presenting here. Uh, accompanying me are um, Rajesh Nair, who's our Chief Technology Officer, uh, Rajiv Rajavasi Reddy, who's a VP of Product Management, we've got uh, Rob Cummins, who is our VP of Marketing, and I am Narayan Venkat, who is the Chief Marketing Officer for the company. So um, we've got a fairly you know, interesting set of slides to present to you, you know, give you a glimpse of who we are as a company, what we do, uh, the traction we're seeing in the market and our value proposition to our customers. So let me start with this. Uh, let me first start by saying how to pronounce the company's name. There's a lot of questions on is it Tejal, is it Tejal? Uh, it's actually pronounced as Tejal. Um, and if you're wondering where we got the name from, it's a combination of technology and agility. And so uh, it's an anagram of those words, and it's uh, essentially called Tejal. So for those of you, uh, from here onwards, you have now been you know, educated on how to yeah. pronounce Tejal. OK, so here's the agenda for the day. I'll do, you know, Rob is going to do the introduction. Instead, I jumped in myself. Um, we're going to give you an overview of the company, the products. And then uh, clearly, this is a very technical audience. And we've spent, uh, you know, we'll spend a fair bit of our time actually diving deep into the technology so that you get a perspective of what our technology is and how do we differentiate ourselves. Uh, and that's going to be done by Rajesh. Uh, if time permits, we'll do a demonstration. And then we'll certainly open it up for questions. Uh, we'll also be happy to take questions along the way. OK, so as I said, we are, uh, we are pronounced as Tejal. Um, and our focus is essentially to help transform IT by transforming your storage with intelligent flash storage systems. Uh, we are an enterprise flash storage company with a twist in the sense that we offer all flash and hybrid in the same system. And uh, we've been growing pretty rapidly in our emerging flash storage player. We were founded way back in 2010. First product shipped in, uh, and launched in 2012. And I'll give you a sense of the market momentum that we're seeing. Uh, we have presence certainly in North America, but there's a global expansion underway. We have presence in EMEA, uh, as well as a small presence in Asia Pac. And uh, you know, backed by a very strong management team, um, you know, we've, uh, many of us have actually worked in the storage space, uh, having spent many, many years in the storage industry. And our, our main goal and focus is to enable business transformation, business transformation through storage transformation. And uh, our focus is to enable application acceleration, and while doing so, delivering significant economics through capabilities like uh, data reduction, et cetera. And we'll go into some level of detail on that. So a little bit of uh, history, right? So the company was founded in 2010, as I mentioned. The first product shipped in, and launched actually February 2012 with 50 customers, right? Uh, ever since, I know Chin Fao was here asking me earlier questions, you know, how else, you know, you, I've heard a lot about you guys, you know, how are you growing? So here's a glimpse into it. You know, we've been on a rapid pace from a customer acquisition standpoint, right? So we're coming up close to about 700 customers across a broad range of uh, applications and industries. Um, we are focused on the enterprise, I would say perhaps the enterprise mid-range. Uh, we have deployed over 1,200 systems in the field, and uh, we are uh, predominantly a channel-centric Go, we have a channel-centric go-to-market model. So we've got about 300 plus partners you know, coming up by the end of the year. right? And uh, if you ask the question as to where we've been deployed in customer environments, we see deployments of our flash storage systems or hybrid systems uh, across a wide variety of applications. So think server virtualization, desktop virtualization, databases, et cetera. And, uh, we see uh, adoption of our technology across a broad range of vertical markets as well. So we're more horizontal focused, and we see success. Uh, we've seen success across a variety of different uh, vertical markets. So a lot of you are experts in this field, uh, having tracked many companies in the storage space. We're in the early stages of a, a massive flash revolution, right? And if you broadly look at the different kinds of applications in the market space and, and what's deployed in the enterprise, you will see a rough approximation in terms of applications that are you know, essentially critical to the business, which I tend to call critical data, 
Um, data sets that are active in nature, um, which you know your business certainly is using those types of data, whether it's coming from test dev, messaging collaboration, etc. And then of course you've got you know some of the more archives or uh, data or secondary data that either comes from fixed content or streaming media. By no means this is sort of the all-encompassing you know categorization, but you've got a pretty good idea as to what kinds of data sets. Clearly this data. Uh, is characterized by different service level requirements. You know, on the, on the extreme on the right, certainly lowest latency maximum IOPS, where your business is dependent on uh, the speed and latency of data access. And then if you move to the extreme left, you know, clearly uh, high capacity and the economics of large amounts of storage dictate purchase decisions. So broadly speaking, you've seen, you know, you see a plethora of different applications whose service levels are driven by uh, latency, capacity, performance. So, and what we're starting to see in our, or you know, an emerge, emergence of different types of approaches to solving this problem, where you have a combination of hard disk only drives, which has certainly been the case in legacy storage systems, and then you're starting to see an emergence of you know, flash and flash related technologies, or flash and flash hybrid technologies for uh, addressing the service level requirements of performance, capacity, and economics. So if you look at the existing landscape of legacy storage systems, clearly they're focused on you know, many of these areas. But one of the challenges you have is you've got silos in terms of trying to address the broader set of requirements. And uh, wouldn't it be nice if you had a system that allows you to basically dial up or down the flash in the environment that gets you to optimize performance, capacity, and cost across a broad range of applications? And uh, that is what we do. We are a provider of intelligent flash storage systems wherein you can dial up or down the amount of flash in the system uh, and then you can intermix different grades of persistent media to achieve certain service levels. Those service levels being performance in the form of latency, uh, economics, right, uh, in the form of capacity. And we're able to do that across a different set, you know, a wide variety of applications with a common operating system, i.e. the same operating system, whether you're deploying it in a model that's hybrid or you're deploying it in a model that is flash, all flash. It's the same feature set, and we'll go into some details as to what those feature sets are, and the same user experience. So whether you're looking at a hybrid storage system, or, you can looking, or you're looking at an all flash system from us, uh, it's virtually the same in terms of its experience. And so our focus and our key value proposition to the customer is you can dial up or down flash in the system to meet your service levels service levels of performance, in this case latency, and economics in the form of capacity or the combination thereof. So what does our line card and our portfolio look like? Right? So clearly we're focused on helping accelerate application data. And if you look at our systems today, um, this is the line card. And, you know, and I've, ca I've called them out you know, specifically with respect to hybrid and all flash. But one key point I do want to make is all our systems can act as flash, all flash, or hybrid. In other words, I can dial up or down the amount of flash in the system. And if I sort of dial, you know, push, the, uh, push the slider all the way to the other end, it's all flash. It, and then if I move them here, it's a combination of flash and hard disk. And we'll go into the details in terms of the architecture as to how we've architected a system to deliver sustained performance across a wide variety of media. So let's start with the basics, right? So we're clearly in the, in the business of helping accelerate applications. So what does that mean? So what it means is you know, we clearly deliver a significant amount of performance across a wide variety of applications using a combination of flash and hard disks, right? The essential goal for us is to deliver sustained low, low latency. So in the event that you have a fair amount of flash alongside HDDs, the goal is to deliver application acceleration with the maximum number of I.O. coming off of the flash layer. 
We also have the flex, and we'll go into some detail on it. Uh, the way we achieve that is through a combination of uh, um, innovations that have to do with acceleration of metadata, placement of metadata across different you know, layers, i.e., say, a high-performance layer and a capacity layer. It could be, in, a, in, in that model, it's all, you know, flash for the high-performance layer and uh, HDD for the capacity layer. Or should you so choose, you can have uh, a different grade of flash for the high-performance layer and denser flash for the capacity layer. Yes? What grades of flash do you support at the moment? So today we support um, EMLC and, H and for HDD, right, uh, in the standard HDD. Uh, we also have the flexibility of supporting SLC if need be. And as we are looking forward, you know, we certainly want to be able to support PCIe-based flash. What about TLC? We're not there yet. I don't think the economics or the resilience is there yet. Uh, can our architecture take advantage of TLC? You know, if the economics and the resilience is there today, yes, right? We expect that it will become much more economical and much more resilient, uh, you know, as time goes by. But today, so far as products go... It is EMLC. EMLC and then spinning disk as well. Correct. <clears throat> In terms of being able to uh, deliver on the economics, we support a full complement of data reduction and uh, systems and storage management capabilities. So think inline deduplication and compression, uh, and they work in concert, in line. Um, we support a broad range of other capabilities that include zero elimination, thin provisioning, as well as automatic, automated block reclamation. So uh, whether you're deploying this in a virtual environment, so if it is, say, VMware, we support the full complement of VAI, uh, as well as sort of you know, block reclamation capabilities there. Um, since the majority of our, our systems are deployed for enterprise applications, data protection is a requirement, is an expectation. And so we support the full complement of data protection capabilities, both from a systems availability standpoint, so think dual controller active-active, alongside the full complement of you know, data management for, let's say, backup and recovery. So think uh, instantaneous snapshots, you know, thin snapshots, clones, um, along with um, uh, you know, block-based replication across you know, multiple geographies. Question. As the capacities grow over time, are you thinking about other ways of protecting data besides RAID? Uh, it's a good question. So the answer is yes, right? So today we have multi-parity RAID capabilities. Uh, as the capacity is continuing to increase, right, we are certainly looking at other forms of mechanism, right? So erasure protection, right? You know, erasure coding across a broad range of things uh, certainly is the case, right? So today, if you look at the way we handle uh, resilience, uh, and we'll go into some level of detail, you know, as we go through the slides. You know, we've got multi-parity RAID along with full data integrity and data integrity checking, right? So end-to-end -end data integrity is maintained across both flash as well as spinning disk. So we understand the nuances of flash, the, the challenges associated with, you know, wear leveling and garbage collection, et cetera. And, and a lot of what the innovation is, you know, within the software stack has to do with how we lay out data across both flash as well as, you know, spinning media. It mentions block-based replication there. Is it file supported or is that how? Um, it's block-based replication from the perspective that it's snapshot based. It's block-based incremental. So oh. whether you decide whether the, you know, the data is presented above as a LUN or a file system, it's, it uses the same underlying technology. So it's asynchronous replication. Yes, it's asynchronous replication based on snapshots with a point in time you know, image and, uh, and subsequent change blocks between two points in time. Yes? So you said that you will support uh, PCIe Flash. Yes. Do you think in the future you will also support uh, SMR disks? So you are going on that way for the performance, but on the other way we are going. Yes, so, so given our architecture, and we'll go into some level of detail in the sense that we have architected our systems to support a, a high performance layer and a capacity layer, right? So we certainly expect on the HDD side, continued sort of pushes in densities, right? So we expect eight terabyte drives and probably even an order of magnitude more with technologies like Hammer. Uh, on, on the flash side, of course, we're seeing dense flash. We're 19 nanometers, possibly going to 15 nanometers in the future, as well as sort of, you know, uh, die stack, NAND, and all that. 
Uh, but as far as the performance layer is concerned, we'd certainly support you know, the fastest medium there. So if there's PCI to, you know, in the future, shortly, or NVDIMS, it could be PC RAM in the future, right? If it's becoming economical enough. And the architecture is such that it supports a, a fast layer and a capacity layer. So the bulk of the innovation has to do with how we separate metadata, how do we accelerate application, uh, you know, uh, data management, and so think the full complement of data management. Snapshots, clones, inline deduplication, compression, and whatnot. Okay, so, and then uh, one of the other sort of important aspects of it is we support uh, multi-protocol capabilities. So whether you deploy this over block, that is iSCSI, uh, fiber channel, um, as well as file, which in, certainly is NFS, uh, as well as SMB, SIFS, and SMB3. Okay, and one important point to note is all our systems come bundled with the full capability of the software as part of our initial system offering. Question? Yes. Sorry, you let. Uh, on the block and file sort of combination, yeah. is it block and file to the same storage or is block yes. over here and file over there? No, it's block and file to the same storage, right? You can use block and file to the same pool if need be. Uh, in other words, I've, I've got you know, a bunch of capacity, right? I can carve out a certain amount of capacity and make it available over block. It could be fiber channel, it could be iSCSI. I can take a certain amount of capacity from the same pool, make it available over NFS or SMB SIFs, right? And all the data management functionality is available across all, as, all, all different access methods. So whether the snapshot works the same way, whether it's for block or file. You know, clones, thin provisioning, dedupe, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All right, um, maybe you have not mentioned that. What about scale-up architecture? Yeah, so, so today we are a uh, dual controller scale-up architecture, right? Uh, we do not have a scale-out architecture here today, but that is something that's in the works, and I can't comment on the exact yeah. timing of it, though. Right. Right? Yeah. Uh, but we'll take that offline. Okay. You can't comment on the Exact timing of exact it. Exact timing. Near, <laughs> far. Um, I would say that, uh, okay, define near in your terminology. Um, 12 to 18 months. Yes. Very much so. Way before that. But that said, you, well, can't, okay. you can't pin me down for so, a specific date. No, of date. course not. 64 yeah. days to 72 days. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but do you support like um, I'll call it auto tiering kinds of capabilities? Yeah, so we'll we'll get to the the the, the discussion. Uh, a lot of our innovation has to do with metadata separation. So you will see that as we sort of discuss this as to how we position data at the fastest tier to deliver the lowest latency possible, right? So in a sense, there is already a classification of data and how it gets placed, right? Uh, but this is a discussion we have, you know, order tiering could be a pretty big discussion depending on, you know, uh, you know, there's some expectations of, you know, how people order tier and what vendors have done, right? So we go through the slides and I think we'll, we'll, we'll bring it up again and we'll have a discussion. Okay. Yes. Do I have to buy um, a packaged software and hardware solution from you? You buy a system. No, 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 sorry, I mean... Um, can I buy just the software? Let's say I'm a bigger company than you and I can buy servers cheaper than you. Can I buy just the software from you no. and you certify it on, no? No, we are a systems company. So you buy everything from us. Um, Do you have any plans to have no. a software only? No? No. Okay. So, will you speak later on about uh, the, the remote replication? Yes. In, uh, okay, yeah. I'll leave it for later then. Okay, so couple. So I, I gave you a glimpse of what the arrays can do along with its software, and we'll get we'll do a deeper dive in terms of the actual software stack. Uh, coupled with that is an offering what we call IntelliCare. This is a combination of technology, people, process, and support tools to ensure that a customer's deployment is well taken care of. So what does that mean? I'll go into some level of the detail on this. We gather telemetry data, we gather data uh, in terms of what's happening in systems, right, within, the, within a customer's deployment, and that gets shoved back into a cloud for data gathering, and we can do analytics on it. So simple examples being, you know, uh, how have my latencies on a particular volume trended over the last 90 days, as an example, right? 
Uh, I have deployed a specific application across a specific sets of LUNs <coughs> that best practices, you know, we've got the ability and analytics to be able to tell you whether these sets of applications when deployed with these kinds of block sizes, is that what we typically see across the broad deployment of our, you know, customer base. So how, how much information are you sending back and how often? Um, it's, it's very tunable. Right, so you can send it as quick as every five minutes, right? This is sort of asynchronous data. There's right. always synchronous data, for example, drive goes offline, right? Or, you know, there's a controller failover, so, uh, right? So those kinds of events get propagated instantly, right? Then there are those that, you know, I'm gathering statistics that are local to the system, and then once in five minutes, once in 30 minutes, depending on how I've set it up, it can be pushed back up, right? So there's tremendous amount of flexibility. Uh, a lot requires, you know, obviously this is dependent on a customer feeling comfortable, you know, you know, willing to sort of, you know, let data get streamed out of their environment. Clearly, we are only gathering statistics on usage, health, you know, environmentals, and, and, and a whole bunch of other things as it pertains to people. Pardon me? It can be turned off. I mean, there are certain customers who say, nope, and I'm not going to go do this, right? Um, so we gather a tremendous amount of analytics, and then once those, you know, that data is actually stored in the cloud, right? And then we can run a number of different algorithms, analytics, trending, understanding of how data is being used, what are the best practices. If you have misconfigured your system, we can become proactive about it, right? And uh, coupled with all of that is our backend systems that will allow you to then essentially create, automate the process of ticket creation and perhaps even sort of dispatch data, you know, systems or drives on an as-needed basis, right? Uh, a lot of automation is built in, and then you know there's a portal that allows a customer also to log in, and then take a look at what his or her systems are doing and what's the health of the system. Are you running the analytics um, cloud like uh, Amazon? Or yes. The short answer is yes. So here's a quick value proposition, and we'll go into a lot of detail in terms of the in the platforms. You know, certainly. Um, Rajesh is going to cover the, the technology details. But at a macro level, you know, I gave you a view of the different types of applications we're deployed. But broadly speaking, we see three classes of application sets we go into. Server virtualization, desktop virtualization, and databases. Right? And uh, the economics, the performance requirements, the latency requirements, the service level dictate whether a customer wants to deploy all flash or a combination of flash and HDD. And, and that goes back to my you know, portfolio chart. There's a ratio of certain amount of flash to HDD, and, you know, depending on what your systems are and which ones you buy. Uh, that essentially dictates the amount of you know, what the performance you can expect and what's the appropriate economics that go with it. Right? So can broadly, you, Can yeah. you turn on and off uh, dedupe and compression? Yes. Uh, dedupe and compression can be turned on and off on a per volume basis. Per volume. Or, you know, or per pool basis, depending on how you, you Does the system it. ever turn it off due to performance reasons? No. We do everything in line. It is when you have turned on uh, dedupe and compression for a, a pool or a volume, it always runs in line. So okay. we've done a tremendous amount of optimization to ensure that latencies are within expected, you know, boundaries, right? And so there's a tremendous amount of software optimizations that we have done, you know, in, in the, this is just simple examples, right? So in the case of HDD, obviously we take a lot of I.O. that's coming in that's, that's, you know, random, sequentialize it, and then write it out to HDDs. If it's an all-flash system, then it doesn't really matter, then we can handle things, right? Or even in all-flash systems where sequential performance is a requirement, you know, we support different types of block sizes. We coalesce, we do a, a tremendous amount of metadata management between DRAM, the, you know, what I call a cache layer, and the, you know, lower persistence layer, right? So there's a tremendous amount of optimizations that are built in. But the point is that data reduction technology, which is a combination of dedupe and compression, is always in line. And we leverage the significant amount of cores that are there, in, you know, in the Intel CPU cores which we use for, you know, these kinds of operations. Do you do any additional um, compression or dedupe post-process with more aggressive algorithms and things like no. that? Okay. And I, the, go go on, Ray. So on the dedupe is within a pool, or is it across the whole system? I mean, as far as the domain for the deduplication? Um, 
broadly speaking, since you're handling metadata, right, and you know signatures, etc., it's typically on a pool basis. On a pool basis. Right now, you can create a you know you can create a system with a single the pool, whole pool yeah. right, and and multiple sort of virtual volumes or virtual file systems coming out of it, so it gets dedup across that entire you know uh, you know amount of capacity, right? So. And you've, you don't have any custom silicon or anything, do you? You just Intel? No custom silicon. It's standard x86 architectures uh, on the CPU front. Uh, we use um, SAS fabrics on the back end, right? And then a combination of you know, different grades of you know, flash SSDs, uh, as well as spinning disks. So there's no Intel hardware assist compression or anything like that? We are leveraging the cores as much as we can. And mind you, you know, today's sort of technology from a, you know, you, know, you run an Intel, you know, a, 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 an eight core system, you can grab a core and run it at line rate, you know, the north of a gigabyte per second of uh, data movement, you know, in and out. So it's pretty, pretty efficient. Um, a couple of points to note, you know, these numbers, and I say 5x to 10x improvements, let me throw some numbers at you so that you've got, you know, some reference points. Usually these are against legacy storage systems and latencies will vary anywhere from five milliseconds to 10 milliseconds for I.O. Right? That's what legacy storage systems see. I mean, even if you look at a tier one system, uh, a high-end tier one system, and I won't name any competitors out there, you know who I'm talking about, you know, the latencies run anywhere between five to eight milliseconds, right? So when you're talking about that, whether it's an all-flash system, we're in a sub-millisecond range, or if it's a hybrid storage system, it's between one and two milliseconds, you've got a good 5x performance gain. Tremendous gains in performance, right? Now, here's an interesting point, which is broadly speaking, what we have seen is that for server virtualization deployments, we see anywhere between three to one to five to one data reduction. Okay? And um, we've done a number of optimizations and plugins to ins ensure uh, VM consistent backup recovery. So we support the full complement of VADP, VAI, or Microsoft VSS infrastructures. So taking snapshots, being able to replicate them, on a per you know, uh, volume basis or a group of uh, you know, virtual machines is relatively straightforward. We also support the full complement of capabilities for consistency groups, right? So broadly speaking, the reason I'm bringing this up is that in the majority of our deployments for server virtualization, you see our entire portfolio of software capabilities extensively used. So think snapshots. So you can take snapshots literally you know, instantaneously, every second, right? Um, and, and that's, you know, so one of the advantages we see is that, you know, customers extensively use these capabilities, whether it's for, you know, DR purposes or backup and recovery purposes. What's the maximum amount of snapshots you can have on a system? Uh, there isn't a limitation, but that said, right, so the, what we've observed, we've tested it up to about, you know, 96,000 snapshots per system. Generally, we don't see that. Uh, on a per volume basis, today we've tested up to you know AD 192 right snapshots per volume right, and so you can take any number of snapshots you want. Um, on the desktop virtualization side, here of course we've we've seen uh, tremendous. So let me sort of step back for a moment, right? Which is if you look at the broad spectrum of deployments that we've seen, we probably say about 50 to 50, 60 percent tend to be server virtualization. There's about 20% uh, you know, uh, desktop virtualization in terms of storage capacity consumed, and then uh, databases sort of account for the rest. Uh, and as you would expect, you know, there's a fair <coughs> healthy mix of hybrid storage systems in these spaces. And uh, as you get into more database latency sensitive environments, there's a significant amount of flash uh, in the deployment. So we see a lot more all flash deployments, all flash array deployments for databases. Um, in uh, desktop virtualization, we typically see anywhere between eight to one to ten to one reduction. Right? That shouldn't be surprising. Um, you know, that's uh, across the board what we've seen, and we've got a number of customers that do this. Uh, we have something called the donut charts. Uh, for those of you who don't know what the donut chart represents <coughs> is, and we'll go into it, you know as we go through it. Um, each of our systems comes with. Uh, it gives you a complete view of how you achieve data reduction from your base system. It comes in the combination of compression and dedupe. There are vendors out there that will claim that you know, snapshots are deduplication. Not really. Right? So we support the full complement of data reduction that includes compression and dedupe, and they work in unison. 
right? We also support encryption so that the entire stack works in unison, right? And um, so over and above that, we have snapshots. So the point there is, as far as data reduction goes, you get the benefit of compression and dedupe as additive depending on your data sets. Yes? Did you say you have encryption and yes. then you said so that the entire stack works in unison? Right. In other words, um, we use drives, right? So we do key management in our software stack mm -hmm. so that if you so choose, you can encrypt the system, right? And all the key management is handled natively in the system, right? So it's completely transparent and there's no impact to performance because the encryption is handled at the drive layer. And we orchestrate the entire encryption across this with key management. Is that just the spinning drives? Both flash as well as... as so well it's as software encryption at the drive level? Yes. It's not at the controller level? It, no, it's, no it's, not at, it's not at our controller level, but we at leverage that, level. right? Yeah. So all of the orchestration is handled, uh, the key management is handled by our controllers, right? So it's completely transparent. So you walk away with a drive, it doesn't hurt, right? Uh, you don't have to compromise on anything in the sense that, you know, snapshots, clones, thin provisioning, dedupe, right, compression, and encryption, all of this work in unison. So yeah, it's effectively for using self-encrypting drives, self-encrypting SSDs, right? Yes. And we also ensure that, you know, um, data, when it hits our system, uh, in, a, you know, in, in a system when you require it to be fully encrypted, we handle encryption all the way up, up and down. Do you have a method for exporting or replicating keys to another site? Uh, today we have a mechanism, yes. Uh, we, in our roadmap is integration with external key map, you know, applications, et cetera, right? So today we don't support that, but we, we know how to do this. Um, quick, quick question. Yes. It says no boot or login storm. Does that mean you don't handle it, or does that mean you, because you're so good, it, it doesn't happen? <laughs> uh, we, we certainly do handle it uh, in the sense that you don't see any boot or login storms, right? Because in, in general, just to sort of throw some numbers at you, our entry-level systems are capable of 50,000 IOPS, and all flash systems go all the way up to 250 to 300,000 IOPS, right? So there's a tremendous amount of IOPS available, right, at your disposal. So whether you're running a 1,000 VDI or a 2,000 VDI system, when you're running <coughs> bootstorms, you're, you know, bootstorms are, you know, it happens, but it's completely invisible, right? Um, so that's what I mean. Uh, in terms of databases, you know, we've clearly seen uh, deployments across a wide variety of databases that include uh, Oracle, SQL, MySQL, et cetera, and typically we see some millisecond latencies, particularly when it comes to, um, um, uh, you know, when we deploy all flash arrays. So let me speed up a bit. So uh, I've got only two slides after which I'll hand it over to Rajesh. Uh, Can I ask a really quick absolutely. question? I'm sorry. So the um, compression and deduplication, can you turn each individually on and off? So if you're like, yes. if, you, if you're running a database system like Oracle, you may want to turn one off. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. And, if, if and you have even a choice of different compression algorithms, but we'll keep it simple. Oh, right, okay. Yes. You can do LZ4, you can do GZIP, you know, you can do various flavors of it. Yes. Your dedupe is off and you later turn it on. It's not going to dedupe what's on disk already. It's just going to start deduping Correct. new data. Correct. Because dedupe happens when it's being written to data. So one argument to be made is, you know, do you want to read all of them and then write it back in? That's possible. Okay. Right. Um, I'll give you a little bit of uh, you know insights into when when you know you know how we went about sort of designing our software stack. Uh, there are a few design premises that we'll start with, right? In that flash densities are doubling and costs per bit is going to have every 18 to 24 months, right? Uh, we are we expected flash densities will continue to increase faster than hard disk densities, and that's certainly the case, right? Uh, and latency and economics will drive the adoption of different media types, right? Because it's the economics of if you could afford all flash for everything, you'd go deploy all flash. But, you know, the economics of it is going to justify where you're going to deploy, whether it's all flash or hybrid for what set of applications. And then we also believe that continuing innovation in incumbent media technologies, that goes back to your earlier comment or, or, or Enrico, your, your point about, you know, do we see massive jumps in densities in, on the you know, HDD side, probably, right? And we believe that we want to be able to leverage that. An architecture must be able to leverage that so that we can offer systems to the end customers that allow us to basically deliver on performance and economics without having to compromise on either one of them. 
So the design goals were that. So architecture must support a performance layer and one or more capacity layers. right? So by that, we can leverage newer forms of media that come in. You know, today it's EMLC. It could be in the future PCIe, you know, Flash, NVMe, NVDIMS, PC RAM, right? Whatever else, right? Uh, the ratio of that is going to depend on the economics and the amount of you know the willingness that the customer has to pay up for it. Certainly, one or more capacity layers. So it could be hard disk today. It could be dense flash. It could be TLC in the future, right? It's the economics of it. What about plugging into cloud services and object stores and things like that? <laughs> so uh, we are, do we have the capabilities to do that? Yes. Today we do not support it. We're, we're a small enough company that we're going to go focus on that. Uh, you know, there is a meta level question to ask is whether it makes sense to actually, you know, to your earlier question about software, mm -hmm. can I run it as an instance in the cloud and use that as a, you know, Potential for a backup as a backup target, doable, but we aren't going there yet. Okay. Um, we wanted to deliver data management at speed and scale of the fastest medium in the layer. In other words, uh, all data management. You guys know this from a storage perspective. Ninety-eight percent of storage operations have to do with metadata management. Whether it's snapshots, it's clones, it's thin provisioning, your deduplication, handling dedupe tables, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the requirements was for us from an architectural standpoint was to have a data management at the speed and scale of the fastest medium. And for us to be successful in this market, uh, it requires that we deliver a comprehensive data management stack that works seamlessly across whatever form of persistence medium you have. And then abstraction of the media types is really important from an architectural perspective for us to be able to incorporate newer media. So whether it's you know, 8 terabytes or 80 terabyte drives that come out in the future, or dense flash, how do we handle that? And how do we do it you know, in a manner that understands the nuances and the, and, you know, and the specialities of the appropriate media? So if you're abstracting media types, and I have a shelf with like 400 gig flash now, can I throw in an 800 1.6, 2.4, .4, and it's going to allow me to use all the space of all of them? Yes. The short answer is yes. There's also new, you know, there's also details about the drives themselves that we understand, right? So part of how we facilitate, and I won't st steal Rajesh's thunder here, part of what we do in terms of understanding the drive characteristics, particularly when it comes to flash. Uh, you know, and, and, and orchestrating things like, uh, you know, wear leveling and endurance and all mm. of that. Yes, so the short answer is yes. All right. uh, and that leaves, you know, that basically gets me to our software stack, which we call IntelliFlash, and we're, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail and discussion. I'll leave that to Rajesh. But the intent is essentially to cover at least three to four of these layers where bulk of our innovation <coughs> is, which has to do with how we handle physical media, media optimization across different grades of persistent media, uh, our separation of metadata for accelerating metadata and ac accelerating all storage functions, and then certainly the data services that work comprehensive, you know, in conjunction with the rest of the um, stack. So with that, I will hand it over to Rajesh, but before I do that, any further questions for me? I have one quick yes. question. Um, Eric said, so if you have dedupe turned off and then you turn it on subsequently later, it, you don't go and dedupe the data that's already on the drive. But as the drive does its own housekeeping and what have you and relays the data out, does that go through the dedupe engine? No, so it won't eventually over to, okay. Are, are you using your own garbage c control engine or just what's on the disk? Uh, it's actually, we do not, so let me back up, right? So we leverage the controller's architecture, the controller that does the garbage collection, but we have appropriate plugins and we understand APIs to help orchestrate as appropriate. So as far as the upper layers are concerned, we've got a better understanding of how drives at what stage uh, in it is in garbage collection, et cetera. But you, you couldn't tell me which cell or which page within a drive solid state a certain block of data is directly. You'd have to actually go through the disk controller. So. Yes, because the disk controller essentially facilitates, you know, it gives you a le level of indirection. Right. All right. How many drives have returned as failed in the last three years? Uh, like yes. solid states, just curious. 
you know, standard AFR is relatively small, we're looking at one and a half percent or so. Across, across all our drives. Yeah, that across that all includes, drives. remember that we ship hard drives as well. All right, so you don't have the numbers just for solid state? For solid state, it's very, very low. I can get back can, to you on that specifically. Uh, it's not measurable as a percentage. Right. 